So uh, our first uh, keynote speaker uh, will be Professor Justin Ning. Uh, I don't think uh, I need uh, to have any introduction to Dr. Ling. Uh, he is a founder of uh, China Center for Economic Research, and now he's the owner and dean of uh, the National School of Development. And he served as uh, a senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank between 2000 and uh, uh, 2012. Uh, he's going to talk about China's mid term and the long term economic growth prospects. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I am delighted to have the opportunity to share with you my analysis about the mid term and the long term growth perspective in China uh, at the beginning of the year. Well, if we want to look in the future, I think it's better to have a little review of the history. China started the economic transition from a planned economy to a market economy in 1979. At that time, China was one of the poorest country in the whole world because its per capita GDP was less than one third of the average in the poorest continent, sub-Saharan Africa countries. And uh, in the past 36 years, the average annual growth rate in China was 9.8%. As a result, China overtook Japan in 2009, became the second largest economy in the world. And according to IMF, and the World Bank last year, measured by purchasing power parity, China overtook US, became the largest economy in the whole world. And that during this period of time, China opened its economy to the world, and so the trade growth rate on the average was 16.3% per year, and China became the largest exporter in the world in 2010 and uh, became the largest trading country in the world in 2013. And uh, during this period of time, 680 million people got out of poverty. And China also contributed to the recovery of East Asian financial you know, crisis when they were hit, and also 2008 global crisis. But with this kind of miraculous performance. In the last few years, there's a lot of uh, speculation about the coming collapse of the Chinese economy. And the main reason was that the economic growth rate in China started to decelerate in the first quarter of 2010, and now it has been lasted for more than 19 quarters. And uh, in the third quarters of last year, the gross rate was 7.3%, and uh, the downward pressure is still very heavy. So under this kind of situation, people think it was the first time that China experienced such a long-term, long period of deceleration in its gross rate, and the people thought this kind of deceleration was caused by the structural internal problem, and those problems are very hard to deal with. And so people expect Likely, the growth rate, you know, the, 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 is the growth rate continue to decelerate or not? Well, certainly, China is a transition economy. There must be a lot of structural problem in China. But I'd like to argue, the main reason for the deceleration was not because of the internal structural problem. I would like to argue, the main reason for the deceleration was external and uh, cyclical. Because we can see some other economies in a sense state of development, like Brazil, like India, they also experienced similar pattern of deceleration. And that deceleration was even sharper than the deceleration in China. Not only the emerging market economy like China, Brazil, India, you can look into some other high income, high performing economies like Singapore, like Korea, they also experienced similar deceleration in the same period of time, 
and that deceleration was also even sharper than China. So there must be some common external problems that all these economies face. And, uh, and uh, it's also not hard to understand because if we want to understand the economic growth rate in any country, we know that there are three drivers of growth. And the first driver is export. The second driver is investment. The third driver is consumption. And we know that for export, after the 2008 global crisis, the high income countries in the US, in Eurozone, in Japan, have not fully recovered yet. And under this kind of situation, the export to the high income country decelerated. And that was one main reason for the deceleration in the export-oriented economies in the world. And the second one, investment. We know that every country in the world adopted a certain kind of fiscal stimulus to support investment in 2008, when the economies were hit by the crisis. And those projects, after, after four, five, six years, are either completed or close to complete. So under the kind of situation, unless you have further investment, otherwise, the investment growth rate will also decelerate it. That was the second reason. And the third one is consumption. Luckily, the consumption in China is still very strong. Like in 2013, the growth rate of consumption was 9%. And in 2014, I expect the growth rate of consumption will be at least 8% among the highest in the whole world. And that was the reason why China was able to maintain about 7% growth rate. Then let's look into the future. Is China going to decelerate and causing the collapse of the economy as many doomsday shares predict? Or China will maintain its growth rate between 7 and 8% growth? Well, certainly it depends. First, it depends on whether the high-income country are going to re recover strongly or not. And the second one certainly is domestic you know, source of demand, whether they can continue to boost. And for the external situation, although we have some you know, speculation about the strong recovery in the US, certainly I hope it will be stabilized, it will continue to grow dynamically. But I think there's still some uncertainty there because we know that unemployment rate in the real term in the US is still very high. And uh, in the Eurozone and in Japan, they continue to face the slowdown of their economy. So I think that the external demand is not reliable for China and other developing countries. And so fundamentally, if you want to make a judgment about the growth potential in China, most important thing is domestic sources. For the domestic demand, there are two sources. One is investment, and the other one is consumption. In the past few years, many people said China needs to switch its investment like growth to consumption like growth. And they attribute to the investment like growth as the main reason for the slowdown in the Chinese economy. For that, I would like to disagree. Certainly, consumption is very important. It's our goal of economic development. However, if we want to have a consumption growth, we need to have income growth. And how to derive, how to get the income growth? We need to improve the labor productivities. And the only way for improving labor productivities, one is technological innovation. The other one is industrial upgrading. The third one is to improve infrastructure in order to reduce transaction cost. And all three rely on investment. Without investment, you cannot increase labor productivities. Without improved labor productivities, you want to increase consumption, and then it will be an open invitation for crisis in China for a few years to come in the future. If you look into those countries which face economic or financial crisis, overconsumption is always a reason. So I think that China need to start you know, need to continue to use its investment growth. If we have good investment in the right area, improve labor productivities, income will increase. When income increase, then consumption will increase. 
And that is the reason why, although many people criticize the investment that grows in China, but if you look into the reality, consumption in China has been always very robust in the past 36 years. Only average is about 8% per year of consumption growth. Can you find that kind of situation in the whole world? And even in the last two or three years, the consumption growth rate in China was about 8%, 9%. So I think that investment that growth was still the key for maintaining the stability of the growth in China. Certainly, if you want to use investment as a driver for growth and to make this kind of growth sustainable, you need to have good investment opportunity, which give you high economic return and social return. And luckily, China still have plenty of opportunity for those kind of good investment opportunity. Because as a middle income country, China can always to have industrial upgrading, even we have many excess capacity in certain existing sectors, which you have scope for for the industrial upgrading. Secondly, infrastructure investment. China is a middle-income country. We still can have a good scope for further in improvement in infrastructure, especially in the inner city infrastructure like subways and so on. And the third one, environmental protection. The fourth one, urbanization. Currently, the urbanization rate in China is only about 53%. And for high-income country, in general, the urbanization is close to 80%. So there's a huge, free, huge scope for further urbanization. And all these kind of areas will be good investment in terms of economic return and social return. And this is one area I like to point out. This is one area a developing country differ from a high-income country. A high-income country, when they have a slowdown in the economy, it's very hard to find good investment opportunities. But as a middle-income country, we still have plenty room for further investment to improve the labor productivities. But if you have good investment opportunity, you also need to have good resources, right? And for that, China is also in a very good position. Because government debt, Accumulated debt as a percentage of GDP is less than 50%, among the lowest in the whole world. So the government in China can adopt some kind of expansionary fiscal policy to stimulate investment. Not only the government is in good position, saving rate in China is close to 50% of GDP, among the highest in the whole world. So that means the government can use its fiscal expansion to leverage private sector investment. If you want to make investments, certainly you need to import raw material, equipment, and technology. You need to have foreign reserves. China has $4 trillion of foreign reserves. So China is not limited by the investment resources as long as we want to make investment. And I'd like to mention this is something China differs from other developing countries. Other developing countries should also have good investment opportunities. But they may be constrained by the government fiscal position, or law saving, or you know, limit foreign reserves. China are not limited by that. So with this kind of understanding, I am confident China will be able to maintain between 7% to 7.5% growth rate in the coming years. Even the external economic, you know, a, a, a situation is not so robust as pre-crisis in 2008. China will be able to maintain between 7 to 7.5 percent growth rate. And it's not only in the coming one or two years. I think there's an opportunity for China to maintain this kind of robust growth rate continuously for another 10 or 15 years. The main reason is that China is a developing country and we know that for developing country, for developed country, if you want to have a sustained growth for a long period of time, you need to have a continuous stream in technological innovation and also in industrial upgrading. That is the only way to have a sustained long-term growth. In high-income country, we know, like in the US, in Europe, in Japan, their industry, their technology are on the global frontiers. So if, you want to, if they want to have technological innovation, industrial upgrading, they need to invent those kind of technology 
or industries. But China is still a middle-income country. There's something called advantage of backwardness. In the technological innovation and industrial upgrading, China can still benefit from the existing technology and industry in the world as a source of its technological innovation and industrial upgrading. And that was the reason why China was able to maintain 9.8% growth rate continuously for 35 years. But in the future, how large that the advantage of backward is still there? I think the best way to measure that is the per capita income level. Because per capita GDP is a reflection of the average technology and average value added of the industry in the country. And by that measure, in 2008, that is the newest data I can have, China's per capita income, per capita GDP, was 21% of the US per capita GDP. And it was similar to Japan in 1951, Singapore in 1967, Taiwan, China in 1975, Korea in 1977. And all these four East Asian economies, based on the same level and a gap with the US, they maintain 20 years of 7.6% to 9.2% for 20 years. If they can realize this kind of growth rate on the same mechanism for 20 years between 7.6 to 9.2%, I think China has a potential growth rate of 8% per year for 20 years starting from 2008. <clears throat> if realize China's per capita income by the time of 2030 will be 50% of the US per capita income measured by purchasing power parity. Population size in China is four times of the US. So measured by purchasing power parity, the economic size in China can be twice as large as the US. Certainly, if you want to look into the measurement by market exchange rate, that depends on how rapid the currency appreciation in China. But most likely, the economic size of the China will be at least 1.5% at 1.5 times of the US economic size. So that's likely scenario if the growth potential is realized. But certainly, it's only a potential. If China wants to tap into the potential, China needs to you know, maintain the social political stability to make people happy. But currently, people in China are not very happy due to the income disparity, due to the corruption, due to the pollution, due to the relation-based transaction instead of the rule-based transaction. And the first two, income disparity and uh, corruption, makes low-income and middle-income people unhappy. Pollution makes everyone unhappy, and especially for the high-income people. And uh, this kind of relation-based transaction instead of rule-based transaction make foreigners very unhappy. So with this kind of problem, since everyone is unhappy about China. And so that's the reason why, even though the economic performance is so good in the past 35 years, but many people always predict Chinese economy is going to collapse because of these kind of issues. But how come? that with such a you know, remarkable economic performance that China had those kind of problems. I think it related to the way China engaged its transition from a planned economy to a market economy. As you know, that China did not adopt the Washington Consensus structure RP, tried to remove all the distortions simultaneously when China started the transition from a planned economy to a market economy. China adopted a pragmatic, gradual, dual check approach. On the one hand, continue to provide certain kind of protection and subsidies to the old priority heavy industry capital intensive sectors. On the other hand, liberalize the entry to the new sectors which are consistent with China's comparative advantages. This approach allowed China to maintain stability and achieve dynamic economic growth during its transition from a planned economy to a market economy 
and avoid the collapse, as we observe in former Soviet Union, Eastern European country. But this approach, China also, you know, pay some cost because the need to protect those kind of old sectors rely on all kind of distortion in the factor price in the market. And those kind of distortions create the income disparity because the sectors which receive the subsidies are general large scale capital intensive firms either owned by the state or now by quite a number of private you know, owners. And they receive subsidies, they are richers who subsidize them, people put their money into the system and without services from, let's say, financial sector and so on. And of course, income disparity. But it also created rent because subsidies means it's a rent. And you're going to have rent seeking. Rent seeking is an economic term. It's another term people understand is bribing and corruption. And, uh, and, and, uh, so, and uh, because of these tokens, the resources need to be allocated by the government. And uh, so you need to get a good relationship with the government in order to get access to those kind of preferential treatment. And uh, so the Chinese economy was a relation-based instead of rule-based. And uh, why, why pollution is such a big issue? Well, it related to the stage of development because China is still on the manufacturing stage of development. We know that in an agrarian economy, in general, environment is very good. Then you move to the manufacturing stage, the energy intensity and emission intensity are both much higher, so you are more polluted. But when you move to the service-oriented economy, then you know, the energy and the emission will be reduced, and you can have a good environment. And as an older country, started from agrarian to high income, they enter in into a stage of very polluted, you know, uh, uh, a stage, just like in, in, in New York, and, and in, 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 co in continental Europe, or in Japan, in Korea, and so on, they all enter into that stage. And China now are still in that stage. So that's one reason why China is so polluted. But it also related to the regulation, environmental regulation, and also technology. So China can do better if we have a better regulation if we adopt a greener technology, but I think that this kind of problem cannot be totally avoided. And so with the understanding of the problems and the potential, what are the policy of the Chinese government? And as you know, in the third planner in 2013, the government promote to, you know, the government promised to deepening the reform to remove all the remaining distortions. And in the fourth planner last year, the government you know, promote this kind of rule by law. And, and so rule of law. So those programs, the main purpose were to remove the remaining distortion in the Chinese economy in order to tap into the potential of the growth in China. And that's the implication of what? I think that China is in the right track to removing, eliminating the remaining distortion in order to have a well-functioning market economy so China can tap into the growth potential. And with this kind of government policy, I think the business operation will have a level playing field between the national enterprises and the foreign enterprises between the large enterprises and the medium size, small size enterprises. And also, you know, in the past, certain group of the firm in China, including foreign firms and large corporations in China, received supranational treatment. Or uh, some firms received subnational treatment. And I think those kind of days, those days were gone, will be gone. Because China is going to move to new merit based instead of relation. In the past, if you want to have good business in China, you, know, you, you should hire certain priestly people with good relation with the government. In the future, if you want to have a good business in China, you need to hire people who are competent. And China will also have to continue to upgrade the industries. 
in order to further increase income, and China will move to technological intensive industries. And China will also rely on green industries in order to cope with the environmental issue. And China will move closer to, closer to the global technological frontiers. So China will have to rely more and more on indigenous R&D. And to make that possible, China will have a much better protection of IPR. And secondly, as Yao Yang also mentioned, last year China already become the next exporters of capitals. And I think this kind of trend will continue that China will become the major source of the capital in the world. And uh, there are several reasons for that. The first one, certainly China is a resources, you know, a, a skills economy. China need to get more resources. China will make investment in those areas. And uh, China has a competitive advantages in infrastructure. And uh, we know that many developing country and even high income country their infrastructure is bottleneck for their growth. And China will use its competitive advantage and funding to support infrastructure investment in a developing country or even in a high income country. And also China will you know, continue to use merge and acquisition to get access to higher technology from advanced country. And, uh, and China also certainly will try to enter into the domestic market of the developing country and even high income country by set up operation in those areas. And the last one, and it has a very important implication is that China will start to relocate its labor intensive processing industries to other low income country. Like Japan did in 1960s, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore did in 1980s. And China will start to do that because rising wages in China. But here I'd like to mention the scale of the relocation is so much different. In 1960, Japan manufacturing sectors employed altogether 9.7 million workers. In 1980s, Korea employed about 2.3 million, Taiwan about 1.5 million, Hong Kong about 1 million, Singapore about half a million. But this time, in the labor-intensive industries alone, China employs 85 million. So China, the relocation will allow almost all the developing countries in the world to start an industrialization age and to achieve similar dynamic economic growth as China in the past 30 years, if they capture those kind of opportunities. And the third one, the last implication, with rising of the income, China will continue to consume more and more luxurious good, high-end goods. And currently, China already you know, contribute to about a quarter of the global market in car. And this will continue to be so, and it will become biggest. And currently, China already consumes about one-third of the luxurious goods in the world. And uh, with the rising middle-income country, Certainly, China will become even a bigger market for that. So with this, I hope that you share my excitement about China. in China about China's economic growth prospects. Uh, and today, I think, uh, is particularly optimistic uh, amid this, uh, this uh, downturn in China. Uh, I bet uh, you have uh, many questions. And because of time constraint, let's uh, entertain one or two questions from the audience. Well, be before you give the floor to the audience, he said I was too optimistic, right? <laughs> but I like to say, I have been accused of being too optimistic for the past 20 years. <laughs> but, you know, I like to say, but the fact proves, the actual performance proves I was too conservative. I published a book called The China Medical in 1994. In that book, I predict China would overtake US in economic size, measured by purchasing power parity in 2015. But as I mentioned, actually, China achieved that in 20, 
14. So I was a little bit too conservative in that book. <laughs> but in that book, in the past 20 years, at least especially in the first 10 years, everyone thought I was too optimistic. So I have a very good track, good, uh, a good track record. Just like, you know, Yang said, if they send to Haizhou, last year you will make millions of dollars. But in the past 20 years, if you listen to me, you may, you may become a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, I see a hand over there. Good morning. I'm George Hoge from State Street. This is a question for Justin Lin. Slowly but surely, the RMB is becoming internationalized. Most recently, we had the Hong Kong-Shanghai Connect, which makes it easier for people to buy uh, Chinese A-shares. I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about your view of the role of RMB internationalization and capital account liberalization in the rebalancing of the Chinese economy and how this should be phased in. Well, that certainly is very important for China. Although at the middle-income country, China has a scope of the advantage of backwardness in many sectors. But at the same time, as a middle-income country, China, certain sectors already become the global leaders, especially in the household appliances. And also in some new technology which require you know, many human capital and also the cycle of the innovation is very short. In those two areas, China need to do the indigenous R&D by China itself in order to maintain its position as a global leaders or to compete on the global frontiers. And for this, certainly, we need to open our mind to you know, utilize the talent in the whole world. And so I think the internationalization of the R&D will be a trend as well as acquisition Merchant acquisition is a source for technological changes in China. And a good one implication is that certainly China will move in a closer to a better protection of the intellectual property right. Okay. Uh, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, Justin, I'd like to ask you about the last point that you talked about, the, the attempt to bring industrialization to many of the developing sector countries, which China has been in the forefront of, especially under the caption of the One Road, One Belt, the new Silk Road, which is viewed often enough from the U.S. side it, as a zero-sum game, that is, China is moving forward, helping these countries in a tremendous project of development that has created optimism in all, all over the world, Latin America, Africa. But President Xi, at his press conference with President Obama, extended an invitation to the United States to participate in this program. And given the problem with infrastructure here in the United States, I think it would be very important if the United States would be involved in this could cooperate to create the type of infrastructural development that the world so long needs. I wonder if you could make some comments on that. Are you optimistic about bringing the U.S. into this and uh, working together with them on this very important project? Well, I think uh, based on economic analysis, certainly if U.S. can participate, other income countries can participate, and to capture the opportunity for the low-income country, it will be good for the low-income country and high-income country. It's a win-win. Because for the low-income countries, industrialization through the labor-intensive industry is the only way for them to move from agrarian economy and uh, entering into you know, manufacturing sectors. And then they can climb the industrial ladders and gradually make, become middle-income and high-income country. All the countries that move away from agrarian to middle-income to high-income country, that is the only route except for a few oil producing countries. So it's a good opportunity for the developing country. At the same time, we know that at the current situation for high income country, what we need for high income country is growth in other parts of the world in order to create the export market and allow them to have a room for, for structural reform domestically. You know? and, and so if we can have a mechanism to help other developing countries grow dynamically, their market will become larger. 
Hainan country will increase their export. With export increase, it will have the same uh, uh, implication as devaluation in the past to create a space for structural reform. And, and so I think that uh, in a hope through this you know, conference and so on, we can spread this message to the politician in the US in the other high income country. So we can join hands to make we have a prosperous common prosperity for all the countries in the world, not only in a high income country, but also in a developing country. Okay, I see many hands, but uh, for the sake of time, probably we have to stop here. Let's uh, thank uh, Professor Lane for his wonderful speech.